Today, I sat with MP Woodward and discussed naval intelligence, the Chinese aggression towards Taiwan, the geopolitical landscape in the Middle East, and much more. He gives a look into how the U.S. is losing dominance as a blue water navy, and the future of what it's going to take to fix the resource supply chain for the military industrial complex, making the U.S. more secure in the process. We also dovetailed all of that into the story of his new book, Dead Drop. Please enjoy my conversation with M.P. Woodward. Hello and welcome to The Arsenic Show. Today I have M.P. Woodward. How are you? I'm great, Robert. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so you flew in from Seattle. Came in from Seattle uh, last night and loving the uh, weather here. Nice mm-hmm. and warm. Have you gotten to the pool yet? <laughs> I have. Uh, my hotel's really? got a, uh, a rooftop <clears throat> uh, pool, so I'm one of the cool people. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it, you can't live in Texas for very long and not have a pool, access to a pool anyway. My uh, entire time in Texas, I've had access to a pool, so <laughs> I, I can't disprove that. Cons- consider yourself lucky. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to talk about your book, but um, I think it would be good if we kind of start and talk about your background a little bit. Sure. So would you kind of walk us through how you got into the Navy and uh, kind of how that all happened? Yeah, I was a when I was a kid, I was really... Uh, perhaps unusually into um, history, and I I live I grew up in uh, partially at least in Coronado, California, which is a great hub for the Navy. And so, you know, in the mornings I would see the seals running down the beach, hoisting hoisting rubber boats over their heads, and then uh, airplanes flying by all day long. And I just thought it was really really cool. So mm-hmm. I, I I just really wanted to be a naval officer. Ended up getting a, a scholarship from the Navy, a ROTC scholarship. And then on on graduation, when you're selecting your service, um, I selected aviation and they selected intelligence. And so, <laughs> the, so I became a uh, I became an intelligence officer and uh, turned out to be a really, really great career because you get to do a lot of different things because you end up with operational units. So while you're not a submariner, sometimes you're on a submarine. While you're not an aviator, sometimes you're in a plane or a special operator, that, that kind of thing. Mm. And I spent uh, that my naval career in the Pacific largely, and, uh, and that which is also entails the Persian Gulf and, and Middle East. I was stationed in the Philippines for a little while. Uh, after that, uh, this was the uh, just about the year 2000, the late 90s, um, the the defense industry was not not in growth mode because the Cold War had ended and uh, the tech industry was uh, going great guns. And so I used a lot of the knowledge that I'd accumulated as an intelligence officer, frankly, you know, in communications technology, moved over to tech and spent the next, uh, uh, you know, 20 or 25 years in tech and ended up at Amazon and Amazon Prime Video. And and that brought me close to um, to things like content and and uh, producing content. And so that, that made me think a lot about writing again. Mm. <clears throat> so this is old hat for you, except you're originally in the back it's, side it's, of the camera. <laughs> it's, it's an old hat that was thrown off and has been put back on again. It uh-huh. feels new again. Uh-huh. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Well, it yeah. certainly has changed a lot. It yeah. continues to change. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Chris and I have this kind of ongoing battle um, where I think that all actors are going away and they're all going to be uh, digital avatars. Uh, I think I think the uh, Screen Actors Guild would maybe have a problem with that, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 I what I've seen uh, is a big part of the evolution. Though, is, I mean, on the one hand, there's been this this huge uh, demand for content, right? The number of scripted shows went up something like six hundred percent. I think in between, you know, twenty fifteen and twenty sixteen, it was something like that. And um, that that's a, a wonderful thing uh, for actors and for writers, but the companies were all spending too much. And now we're seeing that uh, on a pullback right now, right? With Netflix just announced they're going to spend a lot less on content. You've seen consolidation with um, Time Warner and, and Discovery. Um, and all the companies that are big and doing it are subsidizing it with other businesses, mm-hmm. right? Because it's not profitable by itself because you're spending, you know, 20 billion on content and taking in, you know, less than that in, in revenue. So, so companies like Amazon can afford to do it as part of a loyalty program with prime. Mm -hmm. So it was a very interesting, um, business problem to be a part of. I bet. Yeah. I think the, the comment about the screen actors guild there, uh, that I think that's exactly why they would go away. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Could be, could be, could be. So, um, in naval intelligence is kind of one of the weird intelligences in the sense that, um, it doesn't get a lot of airplay. It's not the CIA, you know, it's not the NSA. These are the, the ones that people think of. That's the mm-hmm. like right at the top of their head. In fact, people are probably more likely to think of, you know, James Bond and, 
am I six or am I five or something than they are to think of naval intelligence if they were trying to name one or Mossad, yeah. you know? Sure. So what is it? Uh, why do we have a naval, naval intelligence? Well, there's something called the Office of Naval Intelligence that, that coordinates all this activity. And there's a guy called the Director of, of Naval Intelligence uh, that, that coordinates this. But, but effectively, every service has an intelligence core, but they vary a great deal based on the mission of the service. So, for example, in the Army, you might, you've ever heard the phrase G2. People say, give me some G2. G2 is code for the intelligence officer in an army unit, just like N2 is the code in a, in a naval unit. But army intelligence tends to be um, a, a bit more about things happening in the field, which we call tactical, like, hey, where is this unit? Where are they over that hill? That kind of thing. Um, and given the army's mission, you would you would expect that. And they, they certainly have higher level things as well. In naval intelligence, you're generally aligned with the battle group commander. So you're generally aligned with the admiral, a guy commanding a fleet. And you're talking about vast distances, you know, the entire Pacific Ocean, the entire Atlantic Ocean. And so your 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 chief analytical problem is kind of two ways. There's a defensive one and then there's an offensive one. On the defensive side, you're constantly thinking about, hey, we're in this $13 billion aircraft carrier surrounded by, you know, a fleet of 20 ships. We're, we're, we're the bad guys kind of know, <laughs> right? They're going to want to know where we are. So uh, an intelligence officer's job in the Navy, part of it is to analyze where is where's the rest of the uh, adversarial fleets in the world? What are they doing? How might they, you know, com come across us, right? That's the defensive side. On the offensive side, a lot of people don't, uh, well, you know, you wouldn't know unless you'd been involved in this, but um, one of the things that you, you, that, every carrier battle group does as it's crossing the oceans to get on patrol on station right so right now there's there's aircraft carriers in the mediterranean there's probably one in the persian gulf i don't know for sure there used to always be one now they gap it sometimes and there are a couple on duty in the pacific and as those guys are leaving their home port in you know san diego or bremerton or norfolk as they're crossing that ocean what they're doing for months at a time are analyzing targets that have been handed down from the national command authority right so from the joint chiefs of staff like that level like the dc level and and they've said hey the, these are the things that we think if the balloon goes up that are going to be trouble and so an intelligence officer job is to work with the admiral staff the strike leaders etc to analyze target systems and figure out the best way to do this to do this strike so those are the sort of the, the two primary offensive and defensive things that we think about. Um, so on that, is this kind of, these are always targets, we're just not attacking them today, or are these? <clears throat> think of them as contingency plans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. <laughs> right. So, I mean, you can imagine like, hey, um, uh, there's a pretty good chance people these days are building contingency plans for, for you know, <laughs> things like Taiwan and and Iran, et cetera, right? If something all of a sudden uh, you know erupted in Lesotho, probably not, right? So these are these are the most likely candidates for where for trouble spots in the world. And these contingency plans are just an analysis so that a strike package could be built very quickly to get in and and take care of it. Mm -hmm. And how do you work with the other intelligence agencies like? Like the CIA, like the Army intelligence, like how, how does that all play yeah, out? Yeah, so the, the various military and funct uh, intelligence functions all dot up through the Defense Intelligence Agency. There's a lot of alphabet soup here, but mm -hmm. the, the DIA coordinates all military intelligence functions, even though, you know, if you're a, a naval intelligence officer, you report to the unit that you're attached to, you go to DIA as um, a resource, right? Similarly, you go to NSA as a resource or CIA as a resource. So the, the core job of this and of the intelligence officer is to collate all that information. And certainly over time, information technology has gotten far more sophisticated and accessible, which is, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. A good thing in that all this analytical information can be brought to bear much more quickly from the 16 or 17 you know, American intelligence agencies um, I think in the the bad side, we've seen things like, you know, Snowden, uh, it, it Bradley Manning, et cetera, right? So um, <clears throat> leaks and 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 those kinds of vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. 
that's my world there. Yes, uh, it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, no kidding. Um, so when you're talking about the types of data sources, like with CIA and NSA, it's pretty clear. Um, one is mostly signal intelligence. The other one's a lot of human intelligence, et cetera. Like, like, do you have any sort of like, well, our sweet spot is X. Like this is what we focus on in naval, naval intelligence. In naval intelligence. Um, uh, I, I probably can't, I can't talk about that um, specifically. I would just say that if, if a big part is about analyzing a, an adversarial fleet and where they are, you know, we've all seen movies, right, around, hey, uh, bad guy submarines, um, how, do we, how do we find those, right? And that, that sort of reporting is done with various <laughs> systems. Um, if you're trying to analyze uh, some other kind of target as to whether, hey, what, what time of day do people get there or, you know, what roads do they take in, those kinds of things. You can imagine the various sensors that would be employed in that. And as you say, the, the various sensors are owned by different agencies and so a big challenge is always how do you organize that how do you fight through a bureaucracy such that information stored in one place gets to people who can actually use it mm -hmm. like in um i think in the post 9 11 commission a big a big part of that was breaking down the silos between fbi and cia and there was a pretty good book written about it called uh, looming tower uh that really that really uh, kind of dramatize that and i i think that you know I, every 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 uh, a hallmark of every good organization is that it learns right and hopefully as tragic as 9 11 was hopefully that's something that that we learned and in fact did put in place somebody called a director of national intelligence whose job is to officially coordinate between those agencies <clears throat> But coordinating between intelligence agencies is, I think, an age-old problem. Mm -hmm. But it also leads to, as you said, the Snowden types issues, <clears throat> but also like the OPM hack as well. You have all of the centralized data, and I realize it's a different type of data, but still everything gets centralized, and all of a sudden it becomes a really juicy target. And Exactly right. Exactly you know, right. I mean, it, it, it would be bad enough to get, all of the Navy. I mean, that's pretty bad, but it would be way worse if you get every single intelligence well, agency. And, and, and putting that in, in another, in another context, um, one of the, if, if as part of my research as a, as an author, I'm always looking at conflicts between countries and potential flashpoints. Mm -hmm. And, um, one of the bigger ones, and it comes up in this book, dead drop is this shadow war that's been playing out between Israel and Iran. And you can go look it up, real world news. There has been a, a hacking shadow war happening in real time between these between these two countries. And I remember reading one. I think all the gas stations got shut down, right? And it's so various various things like this. And one of one of the things that I've read is that yes, there have been attacks against, for example, American infrastructure, um, like like power grids, right? Which I know is sensitive here in Texas. But one of the things that's interesting is that we don't have a centralized power grid. We have many, many different small companies that feed onto a power grid. So it's not one big monolithic um, system. And I think that's something to think about. I think it happened by accident, by the way, but it's something to think about going forward as we think about um, vulnerabilities uh, for hackers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, I think there is kind of a massive debate in the security community. Should we have you know, everything be homogeneous um, and therefore very easy to monitor and maintain and update and all that stuff, or we should have weird balkanized, balkanized separate things that don't really understand each other at all because it has much higher survivability. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And I, and I guess it depends on the application as to where the, the risk is better than the reward. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So would you say the, the Naval intelligence is more um, strategic or is it more tactical? Like I, I think the nature of that job is a little more strategic um, because of the, the big distances involved. And also, um, people tend to think of navies as being these big, giant, vast things. And they are, but they're also very finite, right? I mean, we have 55 attack submarines. It's not, you know, 500, right? right? And so... And, and we've got, well, now this is the world's second largest Navy. And so it's very finite. So when you, when you think about a Navy as being a strategic asset for a country, which it is, um, 
you you can you can break it down and say, well, you know, hey, China's got two operational aircraft carriers, so it's of strategic value. Those aircraft carriers are of strategic value to China, and therefore of strategic value for us to understand them and locate them. So I think the nature of the job makes it that way, as opposed to say um, in in the army, where you know, hey, yes, you want to know where an, where an infantry battalion is, et cetera, but you're talking about thousands and thousands of things that can be. Um, distributed across across land masses that makes it a little bit more more tactical mm-hmm. yeah i would imagine the distances as you said I mean, there's only certain things you can do at certain distances um like a helicopter is just not going to be able to fly there <laughs> like, yes you know it's it, never it, gonna happen it, exactly and in these days it's um missiles have changed everything that's quite frightening you know really uh theater ballistic missiles um are 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 deployed with you know all the all the potentially adversarial countries out there we now know that those um, theater ballistic missiles you know break apart when they're coming down and launch hypersonic glide vehicles that are very very difficult to defend these these things are maneuvering at mach 10 Mm -hmm. right and so that is a strategic problem to solve right if you've got a a hypersonic glide vehicle coming at you at an aircraft carrier that's a problem. In the United States, people think, well, I've got lots of aircraft carriers. We have 11. We have 11. And at any time, there's probably, you know, four to five deployed and probably four who are are in the yards going through workups. So again, it's it's actually quite finite. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you about what you thought about those hypersonic vehicles. Um I mean, there's not a lot of great defenses against them. I, it's possible. I mean, I'm, no one would call me that, you know, the, the world's foremost naval analyst. But it is possible, as I look at the particularly the Taiwan um, problem, it's possible that this, it feels a lot like a 1941 moment in that in, in Pearl Harbor that we were a battleship navy going into that and and we thought carriers were interesting but no one quite understood them whereas japan really believed in aircraft carriers and built and and more or less built their navy around them and used them to great effect the the mistake that they made was that they went into pearl harbor and they sunk all the battleships and a couple of carriers uh, were out and that let us recover and it became famously an aircraft carrier war well okay then you know the next 70 75 years have been that way where the carriers are the crown jewel of of a blue water navy of power projection we're the envy of the world because of our ability to operate aircraft carriers but when they become vulnerable from theater ballistic missiles and from hypersonic missiles i think it causes people to rethink things right and so now all of a sudden the the undersea battle becomes far more important because they're not vulnerable to missiles but you know there again we have to invest and stay ahead of things so it'll be interesting to watch how people that do this for a living around force planning and keep in mind the timelines for when the navy is making investment or in in decades right these things have a shell of a service life of you know 35 years and then they try to extend them often and decisions are have been made you know a decade ago or 15 years ago about what our carrier force structure should look like what you know we've kind of already made our bets and we're making new bets in the future but i think we're going to see some evolution on that i I don't know that carriers are going to be you know the 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 premier element in a true global war situation i think Mm -hmm. tactically where hey we want to send a message we want to strike something we want to you know come from the sea and hit and hit something littoral for for sure but in a in something like the taiwan problem where everything is on the table. I'm, I'm not as sure. Well, so in Ukraine, I think now two different times, uh, speedboat, uh, style drones packed full of explosives have tried to take out, uh, Navy ships on the Russian side. And certainly one of them has been taken out completely by a, a land based, uh, missile. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that was not designed for that purpose. <clears throat> I think that there is something really interesting happening with drone warfare, with these small arms that is just so, it makes it so much more difficult to live in a theater where you're, you know, miles off a coastline or whatever. It seems like the only way to do that safely is to be so far out that really there's no reason for any aircraft or any 
uh, boat to be anywhere near you. So you have some sort of defensive sphere around you. You know, I, the way I think about this is, uh, and this is what I think drives defense people mad, but every problem then has a counter problem. And then that counter problem has a counter counter problem, right? So on the one hand, yes, the missiles could, could make things such that, wow, if you're in the theater, you're, you're very much under a threat. So you need your own standoff missiles or you need drones or you need other things. Yet all of those things are going to be dependent on real-time data communications, right? They're going to be dependent on, on low Earth orbit satellites and really kind of somewhat flawless um, systems to, to work well, which of course can also be hacked. So it's this, it's, I think some of the irony is that as we get more and more automated and fancier and fancier, there's more and more a, def a dependence on something that could also be vulnerable. And that's, that's in the, the realm of, um, of, of uh, data communications. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you did, if memory serves from, from reading all your stuff here, is uh, you did some war gaming as well. You were actually scripted some of these war games. I did, and and it was a great pleasure um, to work. I, for part of my career, I was with uh, what was at the time called the U.S. Pacific Command. It's now called the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command um, to represent the importance of uh, you know the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. And when I was in that job, um, the U.S. Pacific Command is typically an admiral, a four-star admiral, and most most people are familiar because of you know Desert Storm and the war in Iraq, et cetera. Most people are are familiar with CENTCOM, Central Command, and they know that whoever's in charge of CENTCOM is in charge of like everything: the Air Force, the Navy, everything that's in that landmass. And um, U.S. Pacific Command, as I'll just call it, um, that that is the Pacific Theater. So it's everything in that hemisphere and it's run out of Hawaii and it's a four star admiral. And so that, that it's almost always an admiral because it's a maritime theater. And within that, the, this joint um, command thinks about things all day long. So a lot of people think the military just hangs out and trains until there's something bad that happens, but we've all seen the military get deployed for, for other reasons. So w yes, I did war gaming around, you know, an attack or a coup or something like that. But we also did um, lots and lots of exercises around things like uh, there's a thing called a NEO, N-E-O, which is a non-combatant evacuation order. And when there's a, uh, a tsunami in Bangladesh and there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of people hurt, you know, the, 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 the Navy and the Marines and the Air Force all respond. Uh, and so I got my job at that time was to write these these exercises and yes there were some war games but there were other things too and of course that was great great training for a thriller writer because i, tr I, I tried to make them as realistic <laughs> as possible and they had to be unbundled uh, quite a bit down to basic message layers and so i wanted i wanted i wanted everybody around the globe who were participating in these exercises to feel like they were invested you know yes we want to we want to rescue that family you know that that kind of thing and it because us pacom is so um vast this is also where you get into liaisons with um, the the State Department, with the various embassies, with the CIA, with the because you're bringing all the resources that the United States government has to bear to solve these problems. Mm. So let, let's walk walk me through one like uh, let's say Russia war is about to invade Ukraine, for instance. I know it sounds crazy. Uh, like how would you Never. script how would you script that out exactly? What did that look like? Um, so you would start with. Uh, I mean, you can imagine you, you would, you, it would starts off as, um, an intelligence exercise, right? Like you, you create indicators and see if, if people pick up on them and you can be clever about them. Like, Hey, um, uh, leaves have been canceled or, you know, there's a rather famous one. I, I think it was written by, uh, I can't, I can't remember. I think it was a Russian, um, and they, they analyzed the Pentagon, uh, over how many pizzas would get delivered. Right. So, you know, you know that, Hey, they're up to something. They're th these are not normal work hours, right? Um, and so you start with some of those things. In you know, often it's, hey, um, these ships have disappeared from port. We can't find them. Uh, that you know, or they've gone dark. We were tracking them, and and now we're not. Why is that? You know, did they know we were tracking them and and shut all their systems off? Like what's going on there? So you'd start there, uh, and then if it's um, it, 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 then that's going to spur a team to get, you know, into gear and just really start looking at it. 
And then you try to game it out as to how you think it would really go down, right? As to, hey, they're going to move these units. Uh, the Wagner Group's going to get involved. They're going to, they're, they're most likely going to um, move the Navy down here to, to try to blockade them. They're most likely going to send missiles in. And you, you really just start writing the war. And that was my job was to kind of write the war, not the response. And, mm -hmm. then, and then I was supposed to do the counter response to that. Not just me alone. It was me and a, and a team. But sure. it was super fun to work on. I bet. Um, I remember hearing something. I think maybe it's the NSA. I'm not sure. Uh, they have sort of a a um, newsletter that goes out once a month. I don't know, whenever. Uh, that's basically like some counterfactual. Like, what if the world suddenly had this crazy thing happen? Like, what if we found like this enormous oil reserve or something? Or what if we found out that actually oil, oil reserves were just totally depleted by accident or something? You know, some weird event. Okay, well, and then here's what happens. And here's how the world evolves from there. And um, if memory serves, it's one of the most subscribed like internal newsletters. Uh, oh, wow. How do I get uh, it? Sounds good. <laughs> I think you have to work there, but, uh, <laughs> but, it, but it's, it's all, you know, BS, you know, it's none of, none of it's real. And the chances of any of it happening is basically zero, but it gets people thinking, oh, here's all this weird stuff that might occur in these weird situations and kind of gets their brain going and maybe they can apply some of the like little bits of weirdness to something they're working on. Like, Oh, actually I bet this thing is going to happen over here. And yeah, it, it is inherently, all of this is an inherently very difficult problem, of course. Right. Because you're, you're dealing with, you know, the, the chaos of a real world where just about anything can happen. Right. If we knew it was going to happen, we'd all be rich in the stock market. Um, so if you start from there, then think about the planning that has to go into it and the lead time to do that really, really successfully. Um, I think that back in the, well, in 1989, the Cold War ends, the wall falls, all of a sudden people started talking about a peace dev dividend. And we started, we went from, you know, 13 carrier battle groups down to 11, all of a sudden did, did, didn't need them. And then, and, and even at that time um, in the 90s, uh, folks in the Pentagon recognize that, hey, the future adversary is probably China, right? A country that big with that much potential um, will want to be a big sovereign regional player. And so a lot of force... When, when did they decide this? I think back in the 90s, nice. you know, and so a lot of force planning went into this um, doctrine that is that is well known that uh, the U.S. used to have a doctrine that said, win, win, hold, right? So win a war here, win a second war, so a second front, and hold a third front. Um, and so they would plan and say, all right, you know, if the Russians are a problem, we need, need to be able to win in that, in that theater. If China's a problem, we need to win in that theater, and we need to be able to hold something if somebody else has given us trouble, right? Um, but over time, 9-11 happened, and then all of a sudden, the, the problem did not seem to be, you know, great power competition. The problem seemed to be, Islamic fundamentalism. And so it became much more around, you know, beating terrorists and finding, you know, spending a lot in terms of special forces and littoral warfare. So the, um, the Navy invested in, for example, these ships called uh, littoral combat ships that um, have a been very short lived thing. <laughs> yeah, very, very short lived. And, and so spent you know, billions of dollars to develop these ships. And I'm not going to say, I'm, I mean, they, they have their mission, but they, in a, in a, in a blue water competition with a peer power like China, um, you would say, well, why did we do that? And you're like, well, because at the time, you know, so now the Navy's looking at, gosh, we need to make a decision. Do we, we have to replace F-18s that have been flying for, you know, 30 plus years with the next generation fighter. We have to replace the Ohio class submarine with the Columbia class submarine. We have to um, replace the current Virginia class submarines, which we still is, are still being fed in, and, and they've just replaced Los Angeles, but there's an SSNX, like a next generation thing there. We, we have to figure out drones, and we've retired all these other ships except for Arleigh Burke class destroyers, which are kind of now the, the workhorse of the fleet, and those are gonna have to be replaced. And the lead times are 15, 20, years and or, uh, more. Yeah, or more and we've already decided okay we're gonna re 
we're going to replace the uh, Nimitz class carriers with the Ford class carriers, for example. And so the first one is operational. The next five or six are on the way. So the money's been spent, right? <laughs> and then the, I think the next greatest priority, the Navy has signaled that, all right, the next most important thing are the uh, SSBN Ohio class carriers because the first one retires in 2020, it hits end of service license in 2027. There's only 14. Mm -hmm. They basically go out every year after that. So it's from the Navy's point of view, it's like, look, if we want to maintain the same force structure we've had in the past, we don't really have a choice but to spend, you know, billions on billions um, in, in that program. And that means delaying something else. So it's, it is a very real problem when we see a China that is now much larger than the U.S. Navy and will be much larger in the years to come. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? I mean, is this just spend more? I mean, well, I think I think that there is a someone needs to get realistic with um, with the American people about setting priorities and budget priorities. And unfortunately, our politics don't don't seem to allow that. I'm a little bit encouraged by um, what I've I've seen some some good some good Congress uh, members. Uh, there's a there's a China committee, um, for example, uh, headed up by Congressman uh, Mike Gallagher, and there it is bipartisan. It is very bipartisan committee, and they have been very realistic about about this problem. And just just to illustrate it, just in so people can understand some numbers. Around 2015 or 2016, um, both the U.S. Navy and China had about 290 ships. 290, we had 294. As we look ahead to 2025, we go from 294 to 290. They go from 290 to 400. Wow. <laughs> and we are talking about combat-capable platforms. And the reason they're doing that is because they are building a power projection navy, a blue water navy, one that can can um, protect or, or control the sea lines of communication, as we call them. And I think two thirds of the world's um, uh, maritime traffic passes through this area of the world, particularly near Singapore, something called the Malacca Straits. We are utterly reliant on things coming from Asia in, in our economy, just for, for semiconductors, for, for everything, the building blocks of, of how we build stuff. Yeah. But, but before we get there, I just think back to this number here, 400 are all of these ships, when you say combat ready, they're not just speedboats with a gun. on. Absolutely them. not. No, that, are, that number would be in probably the 700, something like that. No, these are, this doesn't count gunboats or, you know, support vessels or those kinds of things. We're talking about combat capable ships and and i you know we it, it it would sicken me to think that we don't you know we lost the lesson of say world war ii when you know germany was arming very very quickly and and nobody was really paying attention or they they knew about it but it, they just couldn't make it a national priority in this case what is what what worries me about it is in world war ii we had a national mobilization you know um uh, Detroit auto companies started building airplanes and tanks. In this case, what's what's troubling is that we have fewer shipyards, right? So we don't we 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 have very few shipyards at this point. And then everything we're building is also reliant on, you know, certain rare earth minerals, certain semiconductors that we get from Asia. And so I'm I'm nervous about you know, the ability to just, it's not like building an engine and saying this engine goes into a Jeep instead of a, you know, a, a Chevy sedan. The, these are, these are much more complex systems. And I'm, I'm particularly worried about right now, while I, I certainly want Ukraine to prevail. I, I am very worried that we are supplying weapons that are, that are hard to replace and have a significant lead time to replace. That's going to cost money. And we, and it's got to come from somewhere and the only way, in my opinion, to um, avoid a future conflict is to is through deterrence. And that's what we've done for years and years. And I'm worried that we are now getting behind that curve. Interesting. <clears throat> well, to, back to the Congress uh, comment for a second. Uh, did you watch the TikTok um, uh, debacle, I would say, when they went in and I got grilled? I, I didn't watch it. I certainly I certainly followed it, though. Oh, my. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen all of the different senators, uh, I think it was Senator Congressman, I can't remember, all the different representatives just grilling them. And from both sides, it, it, some people were slightly less cruel, <laughs> but all of them had effectively the same point. We don't trust you. 
And to me, that means if there is a chance, um, now is the time. Like there's such a bad um, feeling from the representatives in general about China. I think I, I agree with you. I think it, it's a rare moment of unity. And and as I said, I when I see that um, the the China committee and it has a more formal name. They are recognizing this problem um, and and advocating that hey we need we need defense modernization soon. Um, in the case of TikTok, it is it is it is it is sort of amusing to see to to, <laughs> to see some people so because it's a very difficult it's a very difficult thing to explain to your constituents as to why you're okay with a company that is controlled by the Communist Chinese Party. Why you're okay, you know, brain. You know, putting your kids on, making turn them into vegetables as they just sit there and scroll all day, and it doesn't matter if you keep the data onshore in the U.S. If you're still controlled by another company, that could change. You know, anytime you want. Mm -hmm. So I, I was, I'm sort of encouraged that that there is that there is that um, attitude and that awakening. I'm, I'm a bit hopeful about that, but as I've mentioned a couple of times, the, the light, the lag times on these things are just so substantial. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, uh, we need action uh, quickly. And I hope in the next, I hope this is part of the next uh, presidential election cycle. I hope that this gets more airtime and it and becomes, you know, one of the things that, that we're debating because the world changed a lot since say 2017 to now. I mean, I think we've, we've all woken up to what, to what a problem this could be. China. Um, <laughs> so let's say um, we try to do something. I think part of the problem is we also have the supply chain. Like, I don't mean the supply lag. I mean what we've already installed in missile systems and ships and airplanes. I mean, we really don't know what's in all of that stuff. Um, to some extent, we've gotten a little bit better about it, and we have to have a software bill, bill of materials. We have to know that this came from, you know, good places, quote unquote, whatever that even means. But there's really no reason to believe that one or more of those pieces of equipment have been tampered en route. Um, I see hundreds of places and a normal supply chain where you could get involved and do something bad, and the chances that no one has ever done anything bad to all of those systems is zero. It's really a zero. At minimum, know exactly all those specs so that they can do something later or hack on the software later, right? So how do we solve that problem? Are we going to bring chip manufacturing back to the United States? Like, how does that work? Oh, I think chip manufacturing has to be diversified. Um, there is a, it's a simple fact that over the years, it became a better business model for um, logic chip manufacturers and DRAM uh, manufacturers to get out of the fabrication business because the fabrication business is 100% about scale and, and buying machines that are incredibly complex and having workers who you can, you know, train to, to do it for less money. That all happened to evolve in, of all places, Taiwan. So now, even though we, we hear about big, um, big chip companies, the fact is, is that those big chip companies, they have a design, and that design is not fabricated in the United States. It's fabricated somewhere else. And so uh, TSMC, the Ta Taiwanese Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, um, they, have a couple, they have several fabs in Taiwan and in China. So we, we literally have this problem of, well, if everything we have, you know, we've, we've moved into a world in tech where it's the internet of things, and now it's the internet of everything. I mean, it's pretty hard to find uh, an object that turns on that doesn't have some kind of a semiconductor uh, chip in it. And if all those are fabricated overseas, even if we had diversity in, say, you know, India and Vietnam, et cetera, well, there's still an ocean between us and and those places, and so yeah, I, I do think that there has to be a literal ocean, there, and and this is one yeah a literal ocean, and this is one of those things that to me is a a good opportunity for public private partnership. I mean, one of the reasons Taiwan got to where they did for chip manufacturing is because the government recognized that hey, we already have a leg up here. We are already doing this for companies. Why don't we provide incentives? And the guy that runs, you know, TSMC or or did is a former Texas instrument. I mean, they came out of right here in in you know in Texas, and uh, 
and said, hey, I, I think there's a better opportunity here. Taiwan looks like a good place to do it. They're going to help subsidize factories. The workers are cheaper here. So all of a sudden, they're putting in machines that really can't be duplicated easily. And again, it gets back to lag time. To just do that in the United States is not something, you know, a couple of cranes operating around the clock is not going to get this done in, in four or five months. We're, we're talking about a couple of years. And that's, it's, it, it, I think it's a very strategic vulnerability. Mm, me too. So what do you think is going to happen? Do you think they're going to invade Taiwan? Is that definitely going to happen or is that unlikely? I, or what? Um, I, I, I think, okay, so if you break that, that problem down, most people will say, hey, they don't have the um, amphibious ships to, to do it, right? So I think a more likely scenario, and, and we, have, we have a very capable submarine force and amphibious ships would be you know, an easy target and submarines are not an easy target for missiles where I think um, China has a significant uh, advantage. But I do think that China will get to the point where they could say blockade Taiwan, where we would have a hard time um, defeating that defeating that blockade. And the trouble that 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 I have is that you know we sit around and we go, yeah, uh, that's true. By twenty thirty five, they're going to be able to do this, and so we're building for the. So if you're if you're China and you're sitting there going, well, the U.S. appears to have woken up, but it's going to take them you know, five to 10 years to, to, to kind of get there to figure this out. I mean, don't you have an incentive to move sooner mm -hmm. rather than later? That's the thing that, um, that most, that most worries me. Uh, so I certainly hope that's not, that's not the case. And I, I certainly hope we can find a way to, to live in a world where, where, you know, where that conflict doesn't happen, but I think the best way for that to happen is is through deterrence. That's going to mean that we make choices on the defense side. It means turning Taiwan into a very tough offensive problem for them. So, I mean, we just watched Russia more or less get their butt handed to them in Ukraine uh, over the last year or so. Um, now, granted, they haven't launched nuclear weapons. There's a bunch of things they could be doing that they haven't done. They have a lot of reserves that they've not put in, et cetera. So we're not seeing the full force, but we're seeing a pretty good representation of what the force might look like. It, what do you think that's doing to China's morale and uh, feeling about all the weapons they've just purchased from Russia? <laughs> well, China has a very substantial defense industry themselves, and they do not have the same supply chain problem that that we have um, for a physical supply chain problem. Now, the, here's, here's another thing, is that as we design chips, yet manufacture them in Taiwan, and as we perceive China to be a threat, we've done things like said, all right, well, we're going to uh, not allow China to buy certain chipsets, right? We, we cut Huawei off and ZTE off for telecommunications chipsets. And as we do that, that, that could, you know, somewhat ironically provoke a China to act a, again, right? So I think that that's, that that's an issue. Um, but I, that looking at the numbers they have, at the shipyards they have, at the, the types of um, sophisticated weapon systems that they're building right now, I don't think that they're, I don't think that they're sitting back saying we've got a bunch of junk from from Russia. I think they've got their own stuff and they're getting more and more um, sophisticated about it. And it is they have a they have a different strategy, right? Uh, Putin's trying to win a land war in a big country like like Ukraine. Um, <laughs> clearly wasn't ready for it. Right. Um, China is doing something different. They're saying yes, we want to we want to bring back a lost province and and reunify you know taipei um uh, but they're also saying we we want hegemony right we want to be the big power in this part of the world and in so doing they have they they worry about you know like if you don't think about it from their if you think about it from their point of view instead of saying you know what they're just they're offensive in nature and they're, they're, they're greedy or something like that. From their point of view, they feel that they're still dependent on the sea lines of communication. They don't want to pay homage to the U S Navy, right? They want that to be the other way around. And I think when, you know, if they end up in that position, they become the world leading power. I think the yuan becomes the reserve currency, et cetera. Right. And I think that that's not an advantage that we want, 
to, to seed, right? So I think, I think it's troubling. Um, I don't think that they look at Ukraine and, and think that that's what's going to happen to them. I, this gets back to the trouble is they could look at that as opportunity, you know, where it's a second front for, for the U S and the, the Western powers, right? With it, our resources are not limited. We're putting a lot of Patriot batteries, you know, in Poland, et cetera. Well, all of those could be in Guam or, you know, the, the Philippines, et cetera. And that's, um, I think that's worrisome. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of, I feel like I'm painting a real doom and gloom picture. You sure are. I don't mean to. I don't mean to. I mean, I've been, I've been having very similar feelings. Um, although I was, I am. So the Russians and the Chinese have similar, uh, philosophical design, uh, in terms of, uh, the communist party controls things on down. I mean, I know Russia has evolved a little bit since then, but, but effectively the same. And one of the reasons why they believe, uh, the Russians are so badly failing right now is that their <clears throat> commanders have to be basically right next to them. Yes. <clears throat> because the people on the ground are not allowed to ask for munitions. They're not allowed to do airstrikes or whatever. They have to ask somebody above them to do everything. Whereas the U S the West NATO in general, um, they say, Hey, I need a, a drop right now. Put him right here. Uh, here are the coordinates. Let's go. Um, and everyone just knows that that's the right thing to do and they just follow through. And, and yes, if you really screw up, you get court martial later. I don't see why China wouldn't fall into that same sort of strategic failure where they would have to put their regional commanders right up front just to do anything. I mean, even, even to move the boats around, you know, <laughs> I, I, I think that's right. Um, the U S has had a long, uh, a long advantage in that it's, it's all volunteer army are, is very professional. Um, its troops are highly educated and, and, uh, motivated. And it has a, a standing professional officer corps that's, that's really, really well trained and is trained to operate, um, somewhat more autonomously, you know, and, you know, just as an example, uh, this is, this, this has changed over the years, but, in, in air defense, for example, uh, in, in the Iraq war, you know, like way back to desert storm, when those Iraqi fighters took off, uh, they were, they were, uh, being controlled from a ground controller, ground, uh, control intercept. Uh, and so a guy takes off and he's just listening. Now, where should I go now? What should I do? Et cetera, et cetera. So it's always, always been very centralized and top down. And so the strategy then was, all right, you, you chop, you know, what did Schwarzkopf say? You, you chop the head off the snake, right? And mm -hmm. then you're going to kill it or whatever. And um, that that is super effective for um, a, a military that is top down um, in, in nature and not autonomous. The trouble I have with China is they know that, right? They've seen our tactics on display for years and years uh, in the Middle East, as well as um, Afghanistan and, and Syria, et cetera. Whether they can overcome that, I don't, I don't, I, f I flat out don't know, but I do think that that has been a challenge with all, uh, sort of non Western militaries is, is recruiting the people to act that way. And I suspect that that will be a significant challenge for them and is. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is, uh, <laughs> this was actually kind of just a hilarious video. Uh, they found a, you know, a dead soldier. They were going through his stuff and inside was plastic explosives, except it was a piece of wood instead of plastic explosives. <clears throat> just showing the level of <clears throat> just kind of pervasive um, lack of professionalism and um, just the kind of uh, way of doing business that I, does not I, fly at all in Western armies. I know, um, I know, but I... I think it's. It, I think it would be a mistake to to compare a kleptocracy like like Russia and someone as corrupt and obviously nutty as Vladimir Putin with the the Chinese Communist Communist Party just because they've been they've been pretty good at playing this long game, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they've been they've been very sophisticated. And you, if you, if you read. Um, if you read Sun Tzu or you look at Chinese philosophy, effectively what they say is we're never going to launch a battle that we don't think we're going to win, right? And the, and they also think that hey, the best battles are the ones that are never fought, like you 
you've won before you've seen a shot fired. And I think that's the path they were on until we kind of woke up. I just think that they're more sophisticated, dedicated, um, and professional than, than what, what we've seen in, in Russia. And when you say we, we woke up, it sounds kind of like the, the, World War II, waking up the sleeping mm-hmm. giant, sort of. It, it, what it reminds me of, yeah. yeah. What makes you think that we've woken up? Like, what it, what signals are you getting? Um, I mean, uh, a month ago, there was a really good, maybe it was two months ago, there was a really good 60 Minutes episode, for example. And it wasn't even just the 20-minute segment. It was the 40-minute segment, right? Like, across the commercial break. And um, it, was, it was all about, hey, is the United States Navy... Um, prepared and ready for, uh, you know, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. And so seeing that stuff slip into the the public discourse is not something I saw at all in, say, 2018. You were just a goofball if you, if you talked about any of this. So I think it's on people's minds. Uh, I just think that solving it is hard. And that's, you know, that's why we have a national security establishment. Mm-hmm. And so do we just need more carrier groups? Is that the kind of solution I, to that problem? I don't I don't think that is necessarily I, I think that those more serve submarines. Yeah, I think those serve a different purpose. I, I think the uh, investment priority probably needs to go into submarines. One of the challenges, as I said, there's fourteen um, boomer attack subs and those are strategic deterrent. They launch nuclear missiles. Nobody likes to, you know, they just you like to know they're out there, you don't like to think about them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are fifty five um, attack subs. But each one of these, uh, every 10 years, I think has to go into the yards for like two years. So it's not, it's not wave on wave. And, um, it is concerning as to, Hey, Chinese undersea warfare capabilities obviously are going to get better. I'm sure they're laying, um, things called SOSIS lines, which are, you know, um, sound, sound detectors that, you know, lay down under the water. Um, they're going to get better and better at that. I, th- I would imagine they're developing automated systems. We're developing automated um, uh, systems a- as well. I-, I believe that the hypersonic threat makes carriers have to be used slightly differently. You don't, nobody's going to just drive up to the Taiwan Strait and say, I dare you, China, go ahead, right? That would be a losing proposition, mm-hmm. right? So I think they're, in some respects, they're, they're, out there for other um, threat problems or for other ways to to uh, uh, counterattack, for mm-hmm. example. Well, so, what would the threat be then in that case? What okay, what is a carrier for anymore? Uh, a carrier is for power projection. So the ability but, but to, to whom? I mean, who who are we? Just anybody but China, effectively. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, the world's a big place, and there's 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 trouble all over the place. So, so one never knows. And it's a unique, it is a unique capability that we have to uh, deploy an an air wing with 80 airplanes on it. So it's, you know, it's a floating airfield Mm -hmm. and puts your air force on, on people's, uh, you know, your Naval air force on people's doorsteps on other countries' doorsteps. And that's been of course, very effective. It's also, by the way, useful for countering other navies. And I I think sometimes if, if you think about, um, the, the purpose of, of, of an army when a war starts, it's not to grab and hold territory. The purpose of that army is to destroy the other army. And similarly, the purpose of a navy when you're in naval warfare is to go and destroy that other navy. And in the Battle of Midway, right, the reason that was so important is we because we took the teeth out of Japan by getting rid of their carriers at the time. So even if a carrier wasn't in the middle of a battle uh, f- uh, for Taiwan, launching strikes from it um, because it couldn't get close enough, um, it would be something that would be super effective on going after the Chinese fleet, for example. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> or maybe holding <clears throat> maybe holding the rear or something. Or defending. You know, China's trying to build. Um, they've already got man-made islands in the South China Sea, right? So they would need to then extend their own force to defend those. We could easily attack those. Mm-hmm. Um, they signed a defense agreement in the Solomon Islands, which gets very close to Australia. So any, they want to build, they want to have a basing architecture that, that goes around, uh, that goes, you know, extends far beyond the, the, the South Pacific as a defensive shield, much as we've done, by the way, right? We've been in Japan since the war ended. We've been in Korea since World War II ended. We've been in the Philippines, Guam, et cetera. And um, they, China envies our basing architecture and would like to um, to duplicate that. 
to the extent that we ended up in a war where they're defending those positions or trying to extend them, then certainly carriers are play a huge role in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So let's talk a little bit about Hezbollah. I know it, uh, your, your book has some things to do with Mossad. And uh, so I thought it would be kind of useful to talk about it. So what is sort of this shadow war that's kind of happening between the two? Yeah. Well, the, the, what, what I try to highlight is, is this, um, we, we often hear about, uh, Iran, um, Iranian nuclear, sorry, uranium enrichment, right? So you take, uh, U-238, you enrich it to U-235 and when it becomes 20% enriched, it's called low enriched uranium. It's useful for things like nuclear power plants, right? Um, when it gets to 90%, it's highly enriched uranium HEU and then it's weapons grade right so it's fissionable and um, we have been struggling with that for years and that the Iranians have been operating these gas centrifuges that do just that and so then they stockpile enough of this material to where they can uh, enrich weapons to, to 90 percent and have and actually build a nuclear warhead so that is that is the problem that we've all been facing for a long time um, the Obama administration signed a deal, the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, back in 2015, I think it was, uh, that said, all right, Iran. And Iran's point is, hey, we actually have nuclear reactors, but built by the U.S., by the way. Yeah, <laughs> really? One, one of them, one of them built by Russia. But yeah, one one was built by by the U.S. And these these need low enriched uranium. And so, and so... You know, for years the the debate has been, you know, how much do we allow? Uh, and and you know, this is the International Atomic Energy Association, the IAEA. How much do we allow uh, Iran to do, and can we inspect? That's always been the issue. And uh, in the JCPOA, that the 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 strategy was we will we will keep Iran motivated to not go to. HEU, right? But to, but to allow them to do LEU and come up with sort of safe storage sites and an inspection regimen and things like that. And then we'll ease up economic um, sanctions. The trouble, of course, is that nobody can really trust Iran, right? Like, were they living up to it? I, I don't know. But certainly there's a lot of people who say no. And there have been, there were there were subsequent inspections where it sure looked like they were they were cheating. And so then the next presidential administration under Trump killed the JCPOA in 2018. And so all of this debate focuses on, wow, Iran's looking at enriching uranium to the point where it could be weaponized. And Iran also has ballistic missiles. So now we worry Iran's going to put a ballistic, you know, a, a nuclear weapon on a ballistic missile and it's going to go and it's going to take out Israel, their, their sworn nemesis. Israel, of course, is not going to allow this to happen is, and is going to be very aggressive. What I, what I highlight in Dead Drop is that it's not as simple as that. It's not as black and white as that um, because there's this, there's this group called Hezbollah, and you know most Americans have heard of Hezbollah, don't necessarily know what it is, but they are, they are uh, an extreme Shia, Shia Muslim fanatics that are sponsored and built by Iran, specifically something called the Quds Force, which is, you know, kind of a combination of, I don't know, the CIA and, and the, the Green Berets, right? And so they go out and they build up these proxy armies. Well, they started the Hezbollah project back in the 80s. These were the guys that were responsible for uh, bombing the Marines in 1983 in, in Beirut. And Beirut is where they are. They're in southern Beirut. It's an area called the Dahya. They are an absolute proxy of Iran. There are IRGC officers based there. It's resupplied from Syria. So it comes into Syria, which is north of Lebanon. It comes down supply routes, and they supply Hezbollah. And the Israeli Defense Force has been out and very vocally saying, Hezbollah is a problem. We can see their weapons manufacturing sites. We can see missile manufacturing sites. They have missiles. They've gotten them from Syria over the years. This is a challenge. And so what I set up in the book is that there's a, pres a U.S. presidential administration that very much wants to continue to contain Iran, right? And uh, well, actually the book is set up post breakout. So Iran has enriched, you know, has the capability now to enrich nuclear weapons, and it becomes a policy debate within the U.S. as to how to handle that, right? How do we contain them? 
North Korea has nuclear weapons as well. And so there's a certain containment strategy there. But then this all changes when the, uh, when the uh, Israelis see a missile being launched from Hezbollah-held land in Lebanon that goes out to the sea. It sinks in the water. It doesn't go off. Uh, an Israeli submarine goes out and looks at it and sees a dummy warhead and thinks, hey, this, is, this, this dummy looks a lot like it would look if you were to put a nuclear warhead on this. So the Israelis become very, very worried about, hey, uh, you know, is it the right strategy to appease Iran right now or do we need to get, to get more aggressive? And the characters in the book are on various sides of that debate and then, and then it becomes a, an intelligence struggle to figure out the truth. So this is kind of real. I mean, this is almost a real thing that's happening. Um, um, I mean, it seems like at least once or twice uh, a decade, you hear about some nuclear physicists getting blown up. Uh, <laughs> if you look for it, you can read. You can literally read about the Iran uh, Iran Israel shadow war on almost a daily basis. So the the Israel Times this morning. So like I mean, six hours ago. There was an article about um, Iran coming out with a brand new ballistic missile and announcing it, and the Iran and the Israelis, you know, freaking out about it, as well as new information coming in on their main nuclear enrichment site at a place called Natanz. Well, the Israelis are publicizing, um, you know, satellite photography that shows that they're building this very, very deep underground facility. Why else would they, you know, be doing that? Um, and so this, this, they are, they are trading shots. All the time, and I tried to put into the book um, some some I fictionalized them a little bit, but but they are, are real incidents where the Israelis have knocked off uh, Iranian scientists in some very chilling episodes, um, and they're doing that because they see this as an existential threat. They recognize the Hezbollah problem, they recognize the ballistic missile problem, etc., and they feel that, uh, that not enough of the world uh, is paying attention to this. So if you were trying to uh, kind of steel man their argument, um, are these people like purely evil or are they just passionate about protecting their land and they feel like they're under threat? The um, Iranians, you mean? Yeah. Like how, how, do, how, would you, how would you try to defend them if you were in court and trying to help out their position? Yeah, I, I think that they have a reasonable point on needing low and en low enriched uranium to operate these power plants, et cetera. Um, when it comes to to uh, the weaponization of them, they will say, "Well, you know, we're we're not doing." They might say publicly that, "No, no, no, we're not we're not doing that." But but privately, at least in my research, I think the attitude is, "Why on earth is Israel allowed to have nuclear weapons?" And by the way, Israel is not a uh, signatory of the um, of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, which is somewhat ironic, mm -hmm. right? They're not. Mm -hmm. And they're very tight-lipped about their nuclear program, but they have one, yeah. right? And Iran doesn't. And I think one of the more troubling aspects would be a, and it's probably already happening, but is a world in which there becomes a nuclear arms race across the Persian Gulf region. And Iran's goal, is a bit like, I mean, less, 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 uh, less ambitious than China, but they want they want to be you know the power of the of the of that region they, they they call it the Persian Gulf we call it the Arabian Gulf officially in the navy <laughs> because we don't want to like calling it the Persian Gulf but Iran Persia you know they they want to be the the hegemonic power in in that region so just like Russia says hey we want to own you know the Black Sea and in in this area and China says well we want to own the South China Sea Iran says well we want to own the Persian Gulf and we kind of through the United States Navy say, no, there's something called freedom of navigation and international rules and maritime law. And no, you don't just get to seal off a whole part of the world for you. Um, the, the other, the other, so I think if, if I was asked to defend Iran, I would say you can, you can kind of see their point that they are being treated um, very suspiciously naturally. But at the same time, their stated policy goals are the destruction of Israel. So that becomes very hard to defend. If they normalized relations with more countries um, uh, like, like Israel, if there was sort of a, a, a rapprochement or a detente there, then, then I think that argument would, would hold more weight. 
I also have seen the Iranians do something that is clever, and that is taking advantage of Saudi Arabia and and the um, the you know a, another powerful country in the region. The relationship we've had with Saudi Arabia has deteriorated somewhat, and because of that, we 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 can't tell them what to do. Right? We don't have a lot of leverage over Saudi Arabia these days. Well, Iran went in and said, "Hey, why?" You know, Iran and Saudi Arabia have been sort of enemies, uh, you know, on the other sides of proxy states, and they've recently gone in and and started to to normalize more relations. They're doing that with the Gulf Cooperation Council. In so doing, they sort of take away um, American allies, and I think it is a very clever strategy on their behalf. Mm. Yeah, I, I've been kind of worried about them for a while for a number of reasons, um, but it also seems like. Israel has the equivalent of a boomer. I don't know what, what it's called. Um, and they have sort of mutually assured destruction sort of built into their doctrine. So I don't really see how Rand having a nuclear weapon really helps them. I mean, it seems like they're better off with guerrilla warfare. Uh, just it doesn't seem like having a nuclear weapon really gives them very I, much. I, I think what it is, is it, uh, think of it as leverage, right? So, um, mutually assured destruction is still mutual right so so right now if they don't have it if if israel can just say you know what we're a little we're a little uncomfortable where things stand we're going to launch this giant air raid and just take you apart israel's calculus would be a lot different if there are literally nuclear weapons staring them down the face Mm. you know via these cruise missiles and 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 potentially hezbollah that's always the challenge right we see that with north korea we used to be able to say you know what north korea that you know we're going to put an aircraft carrier you know we're going to do all these things and now they've got nuclear weapons well that's that that changes things right when they've got when they've got stuff that can hit los angeles you treat them a little differently and that's that's what iran wants but clearly i mean if if Israel wanted to drop nukes, they could do it today. Um, they could, but who, you know... I mean, they don't want to. That's no, nobody point. wants to. Yeah, yeah. Nobody ever wants to be to be in a first strike. So I, I think that, again, defending the Iranian position, they would say, why shouldn't we be at defense parity? Right? Why do we have to be the second-class citizen that the whole world looks at and says, we're not allowed to have these? We're a big country. We're a regional power. These, you know, Israel hasn't even signed the NPT. How is that? How is that fair? Mm-hmm. And and that's a good point. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it is and it is. It yeah. depends. I mean, you know, when you're an irresponsible regime that's that's the world's largest state sponsor of terror, right? right. I think we have a different opinion. Right. Sure. Um, okay, so let's talk about your book a little bit. Um, how did you come up with this book? How did you decide to write this? Um, really. Uh, Partly because uh, in my background, I did focus a lot on on Iran. I have been um, worried about this exact situation that Iran, once they achieve breakout, and I think it's inevitable that they will. Um, they're they're clearly working on it. Um, once they achieve breakout, I worry quite a bit about the leverage that 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 gives them. I wanted to dramatize that um, in a story where. You, you could really illustrate the Iranian point of view, like we just did, as well as the Israeli point of view, like, hey, can't have it, um, existential threat. And the American point of view, and we're not always you know fully aligned with Israel. I think we are much of the time, but I thought it would be super interesting to create a scenario where Mossad and CIA are, you know, at least not publicly on the same page. Hmm. Well, okay, to that end, I definitely have heard people on our side of the fence basically say, you know, Israel is our friend. Yes, definitely. They're an ally. Absolutely. But they're also spying on us and they're also hacking us and they're also subverting us in places that they need to to get things done, just like any intelligence agency would. So how do you what do you, what do you feel like the attitude is uh, towards I, look, Israeli I, intelligence? I, I think that um, uh, I think that that nations spy on each other. I think allies spy on each other, you know, to a lesser degree, certainly, but Israel, uh, publicly, there was a, a U.S. Navy intelligence analyst, a civilian named Jonathan Pollard in the seventies or eighties. I can't remember which, but a long time ago. And he's, he was, he was spying for Mossad. I think as recently as 2018, um, there were, there, it, it leaked out into the public that the FBI was concerned about 
you know, Israeli intelligence being inside, inside American organizations. And one of the, one of the, one of, certainly within this genre of espionage uh, fiction, one of the big themes is that intelligence agencies trade information with each other. Mm -hmm. And that is the coin of the realm. And in the, in the, and, and inter, uh, country trading as data as well. Correct. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Like five eyes or whatever. That, yes, exactly. Yeah. And that, that's what I mean. And so in, in this book, what has happened is that we have a particular asset who could reveal the truth of this Hezbollah missile that Israel has, but we're not sharing the information with Mossad. And they think that that's, Mossad thinks that that's, or Israel thinks that that's intentional because we have a certain political point of view. And so, so much of the action focuses around that core conflict. Mm -hmm. And so why does this bother you? I mean, why are you worried about this? I mean, let's say, let's say Israel does get nuked. How does that affect you here? How does it affect the average American? Well, hopefully not, not much, but uh, I know, I know. But <laughs> no, so, I, so what, would, I mean, I think it would can, be a massive effect. No, it's, no, I know. Uh, so my question is, well, obviously China chip manufacturing, if Taiwan just went away, we would not have yeah. cameras. We wouldn't have cell phones. We wouldn't right. have anything. Right. What happens if we lose Israel? Well, we lose our most dependable ally in the, in the Middle East. Uh, I think that, you know, we, we are still in a world where there's oil, right? So it isn't just uh, a dependence on chips and technology. Um, I remember um, hearing that during COVID, we used something, I'm going to get these statistics wrong, so nobody write me, but uh, <laughs> I, I remember hearing an analyst say something like, hey, uh, in normal times, we uh, we go through 100 million barrels of oil a, a day, or I can't remember if it was a day or a week or whatever, whatever it was, but COVID, nobody's driving, it, it, nothing's happening. The number didn't go to zero, it went to 80 because cars and fuel are only a small part of it. I mean, uh, oil's in plastic. It's in everything, right? So it's in the wafers that, you know, that, that surround the, uh, the, the, the chips that go into the motherboards, for example. Uh, so I think that that, that becomes an issue. Um, and I, I, I don't think that we would want a, a power who is a uh, Islamic revolutionary power, theocratic government, Who's, who is hell-bent on destroying another country to have even more power and to have the ability to hold the world hostage if they want to. Is there a path of peace? I mean, is there a way to, I think to it's get a, them I, together in a room and just hammer it out? I think the, the reality is, is that deterrence ends up um, ruling the, the day. As you said, it's unlikely that Iran would do something when Israel is going to, uh, going to do something back. At the same time, if Iran wanted to, for example, feed a bunch of rockets into Hamas, right, or Hezbollah, conventional rockets, and rain them down and make life miserable for um, for Israel, for whatever reason, right, uh, then Israel in the past could have said, you know what, that's it, we're going to go knock out some some stuff. Um, so, I mean, not, not that long ago, they hit a convoy um, that was coming down from Syria. Like, they act all the time in a conventional way. Well, when you're you know, staring a potential nuclear weapon as retaliation for that, your calculus is just different. Mm -hmm. So mutually assured destruction is the way to peace, it sounds like. I, I, as, as illogical as it probably sounds, <laughs> I, think peace, I, think, I think peace through strength still holds. Mm -hmm. um, I had a guest on a while back, and he was basically, his claim was that only works if you have just one or two superpowers, but if you have tons of regional I, powers, I, I agree. I doesn't mean, seem to work very well. And that's the problem is that you don't. It, it, it assumes somewhat rational actors mm -hmm. too. And I think in the case of Iran, you 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 can't necessarily assume that. One would hope you can at least assume some of it. And don't get me wrong. I think policy number one should be the prevention of Iran getting nuclear weapons capability. And I know that there are lots of people that, who work on that. But I feel there's a there, there's sort of an inevitability that they're going to get there. They've just got too much expertise, too much infrastructure right now happening. Uh, and, you know, the Russians are probably in there helping them out. They built a nuclear reactor for them at Bushir, I think, I think. As frustrated as Russia is over the Ukraine thing, they they have an alliance with Iran. Iran's been supplying weapons that 
you know, these, these things end up raining down on poor Ukrainians. So that alliance has only deepened. It would make sense to me that, um, that the Russians would, would enjoy seeing an Iran that, that bothers the West too. Mm -hmm. So, okay. If that's the case, what are we, um, what are we doing even bothering blowing up a couple of convoys here and there or taking out one or two, um, you know, scientists or whatever, if this is an inevitability, if we are, if you and I agree that that's going to happen, why even bother trying to slow them down? Um, I think that you can buy time and try what to get, that, what does that give you though? I mean, I ultimately, mean it, it could get you, it could give you a more moderate regime in place. For example, um, Khamenei, who is the, the current um, supreme ruler in Iran is pretty old. I think the, the folks that precipitated the revolution in 1979 are aging out, right? And so you could have another generation of Iranians who are tired of this. Um, not that long ago, um, you had a 20-year-old girl get arrested. Um, and they first picked her up because she was wearing the wrong pants. And then they said it was the headscarf was, wasn't, wasn't right. And they jailed her. And six hours later, she was dead from a beating. And you had hundreds of thousands of Iranians in the streets um, protesting and, you know, burning symbols of the regime and, and going actively fighting with the IRGC. So I do think there's the, there is this, like, first off, I think prevention is just good. Yes. If there's a few key people that are going to get them there, it is easy to understand why Israel would do what it would do because it would just be another setback. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just don't think that as, as much as I think it probably is an inevitability, unfortunately, that doesn't mean I don't think people should be trying their damnedest to prevent it. Mm -hmm. So we also have Stuxnet, um, which was used to take out those uh, centrifuges a while back. Um, and we've also seen in Ukraine a massive cyber army amassing um, a million strong. I mean, sitting on the other side of the fence, if I were Russia or Iran, I'd be looking at that going, that's a, uh, that's an existential crisis right there. That's a, uh, that's, we better get our stuff in order. We better arm ourselves quickly. Um, because a, it, it doesn't, if I was Iran, I'd be very concerned about any of the weapons I got from Russia again <laughs> for the quality. Uh, but also the doctrines are also messed up. And also it looks like a lot of the civilians are attacking us and their volunteer armies, you know, of cyber army be coming online. Um, not to mention uh, conventional uh, militaries like Stuxnet, um, which was, I, it sounds like a joint operation between the U S and uh, Mossad. I think that was leaked in some, yeah, there's been many books about it cause it was back yeah. in 2012. Yeah. yeah. I think it was, I think it was originally leaked by some, uh, some general is like going away party or something. And it was like one of those, like, thank you for doing Stuxnet on, on like some PowerPoint or something terrible. Uh, but anyway, um, I think it would be very weird to be on the other side of the fence and having all that go on and say, well, look, we, we had, we had either be really, really prepared, re like really arm ourselves quickly and well, or stop or just give up. It's like really just those two paths. Because any middle ground of just like trying, you know, but not really trying that hard or not like thinking outside the box and coming up with drone warfare, for instance, or things that are uh, more guerrilla tactics that are just like subverting, like those are not going to get the job done. Well, I, I think right now the, the, new, the new frontiers in warfare or defense um, are in cyber and in space. And the the two are very linked because all these sophisticated weapon systems that you're going to build rely on computers as well as the communication systems that link them. So taking out another country's uh, communications capability by being, you know, in space is uh, one can imagine how that would blind, um, blind a military and cyber does the same thing can wreak all kinds of havoc. So I think there's a ton of investment going in there that the, the Danger, I think, with that, what's a little scary, I guess, about that stuff is that when it when it comes to to cyber, it's this there's a David and Goliath aspect um, where you can be 
a country who doesn't have, you know, Iran does not have a big air force, right? It was very small. Um, it's practically non-existent. But you don't need an air force, right? If you got, you know, these hackers that are super good and can, you know, knock stuff out. The New York Times had an article yesterday in um, that said that uh, China had tried to hack into, I think it was uh, the air traffic control system and and hence the air defense system. In Guam, mm-hmm. and Guam, of course, is a key defense point um, that would launch any counterattacks uh, against against China. So I absolutely think the next uh, the next Pearl Harbor starts with a cyber attack. Uh, well, like, that's at least there were some theories that that was what was happening with Russia. They were trying to take out uh, GIS hard for artillery and and other systems as well. But but what I mean, the fascinating thing is, is that the crowdsourced nature of that, right? So then you had you had hackers going back against Russia who were doing it just to get back at right. They weren't mm-hmm. necessarily Ukrainian. They were people from all yeah, over the world. All over and, the and so it's super fascinating to see that. So to me, that it seems like what ends up happening is there becomes an alliance between um, Russia, Iran, China, maybe North Korea, who knows um, that just gets deepening and gets more and more sophisticated a pipeline for tools and technologies for rare earth minerals that are needed for uh, people who have extra special, you know, capabilities or whatever to do cross pollination and research and training and whatever. It seems like we're somehow making this worse. And, and to your point about uh, no longer being the reserve currency, I have to think that the uh, petrodollar is, you know, looking pretty nice to a lot of countries right now. Um, um, until you get the Russians involved and then it's the, you know, Petra ruble or whatever. And it's like, do we really want the U S to be able to sanction us and turn us off? Do we really want to lose our entire banking economy? If we pick a fight and pick the wrong fight. Um, if you're already on the side of NATO, great. You know, I guess we just picked our, that's the side we're going to be on. But there's the rest of the world who hasn't chosen or have, has decided against NATO like, how do we bring them in line? Is there some way that we can stop this alliance? And- um, I, I've, I've, so, uh, you know, I have this, this view that globalization was a really good thing. Like back in uh, 1996 or so, I think Thomas Friedman, the New York Times columnist, wrote a book called The Lexus and the Olive Tree. Do you remember that book? I don't think and so. it was a huge bestseller. And it was all basically like, the internet is here. The information superhighway is here. And... <laughs> Um, we're all going to be connected and because of technology, it's going to be wonderful. And, and oh, by the way, when you include countries into this great chain of wealth and value creation and rising living standards, the incentive for war goes away. And doesn't that seem obvious? You know, the Cold War just ended. That was sort of the, the 1996 point of view. And it was it was a really, really nice thing to think about. And in some ways... It was true for, you know, the next 30 years or so. And that the, the trouble with it is that if, um, if, there, if there's a, the free flow of goods and services, which is inherently a good thing, then private enterprise just always looks for, the capitalism always looks for the most efficient means to do something, right? But, but, but one quick, you said it's mostly been true, except for the multiple proxy wars. <laughs> yes, but there have been proxy wars that have based, been based on terrorism. There hasn't been like a giant ideological struggle the way there was in the first Cold War. Okay. There have been people that didn't want to participate in it, but there have been great benefits to participating in this, in these rising uh, living standards. You know, look at... Dubai, for example, right? Uh, the United Arab, Arab Emirates. And so, and by the way, I'm just saying that that was the prevailing thought. And yeah, mm-hmm. I do okay. think that it mostly worked and that we all saw a rising living standard. I mean, look at the economy boomed in the 90s. Then we had a few setbacks um, in the 2000s around that were based on, you know, uh, terrorist events, right? 9-11. Uh, then we had some some issues like the, the dot-com meltdowns and those Subcri- things. But Subprime when it comes to crisis. supply chains, mm-hmm. um, every big global enterprise will just want to build the most efficient means to, you know, build components that they can. And so that always assumes a world that is secure and cooperates. 
The trouble that we have today is that we're now looking at a world that doesn't feel like it's secure and cooperating. Instead, it looks like what is the beginning of Cold War 2.0, where you have, you know, more or less the West, right? It's not really the West because countries like Japan and India are hopefully in that. Um, but versus a separate system in China, Iran, and Russia, who have vested interest in cooperating with each other, and I think North Korea, you know, to the extent that they look, you know, cooperate at all, um, would 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 be part of that. So the reason I bring that up is because since we've always assumed security, we've created this supply chain that has become, you know, dependent on other places around the world. And so one of the things that companies need to do right now, and I think that government can encourage this, is just supply chain diversity in all things. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday that Apple signed a new deal for radio chips with um, Broadcom, and that, and at least it said in the article that the chips are to be built in, in the U.S. So clearly companies are working on this. And I think what we're going to end up seeing is we're going to see a, you know, every, every, again, I was at Amazon, right? A big global company. But I think most companies are going to have this point of view of, hey, I've got a big global market and then I've got China and I'm not going to depend on to get on anything from China. Maybe I'll sell something in China if I can, but, but it certainly needs to be a, a you know, a, a maybe not a must. And there's too many, uh, companies right now that just source everything, well, not everything, but they support critical components out of China. The guy, and that's, that's trouble. Yeah, it sure is. Um, so when you say diversity, what my counter reaction to that is, yes, but I see tons and tons of very large countries, China being one of them, who are balkanizing and they're bringing everything in house. Um, just like you're saying, we're bringing stuff in and doing Broadcom here in the United States. Um, so when you're saying diversify, I think what you're actually saying is balkanize, uh, bring it, bring I, it. But I don't closer. see it. I, I don't see that. Um, because it, in that, in that world, you would be saying like, look, let's not, let's not buy all of component X from China. We need to spread it out and get it from four or five different countries. Okay, still get China, it from China, though. China, I think, to to your point, mm -hmm. does look at this. If you put yourself in their shoes, they say, "Okay, the rest of the world is going to." Because that means we're now going to be dependent on other. We got to. We've got to insource it. But who's who's? Where would you rather be? Would you rather be part of the global economy where there's lots of different um, choices and competition, mm -hmm. et cetera, or the monolithic Chinese centrally planned economy, um, et, et cetera? So I don't, I think that that is, that is more or less a likely outcome. I mean, I, I don't even think it, I know it. Look at the wireless industry, for example, right? So Huawei was the second, I think they were the second largest manufacturer. They might've been third uh, they were neck and neck with um, Samsung and Apple, right? All of a sudden, they're they're way down the pipe because we said no, we we can't do this uh, with what. Well, they're still very big in China, right? And and we will see that with um, with with chip fabs and all kinds of um, technological equipment. So I think let me rephrase what I think I heard now. One of the pathways to make this uh, better for us is to not buy always United States, not buy always China, but rather split it. Some call it 50 50. I, I think the, I think it's risk management. I think it's diversity in all things. Oil is another great example. But right? it's, not, it's not just risk management. It's also um, showing China we're friends. We'll give you 50% of oh, the business. I, sh sure. I don't, right. I don't think that you have to be aggressive about it and say we're going to, you know, cut everything. And, no, and nobody's really done that yet right nobody's trying to cut off the chinese economy there's not massive embargoes going on there are in some strategic areas like like huawei that we talked about but yes i think that that can be managed but but that means an active willingness to pay more for a component that comes from some other factory in some other country than the one that can be produced in china and no shareholder wants to hear that right so it has to be a national effort that says this is bigger than just, you know, the, 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 the share price or the bill of materials price. This is something that is strategic in nature that we have to protect. We have to invest in these other areas for supply chain diversity. It's so difficult when their quarterly earnings are how Absolutely you live, right. live and die. Absolutely right. Um, yeah, that's probably a whole other big topic we should cover off on someday, but, um, 
so this Chinese spy balloon, um, or balloons, I should say, because there's probably been a whole bunch of them. Um, it seems like China was kind of being nice for a, like, I don't know, maybe a month or so. Uh, <laughs> it's probably Ukraine related. It's not exactly clear. They were starting to say some kind of nice things, some kind of calmer tones and language. And then this balloon thing happened and all of a sudden we're, we're right back at it again. Yep. So what, what happened? Um, so a, a couple things. First off, um, China has been that that area that is above it is called the Cayman line, right? Above, above a hundred thousand feet is more or less space. And, you know, any country can, you know, have low earth orbit satellites above a hundred thousand feet and be fine. Below that line is sovereign, right? So it was clearly a balloon that was in, you know, this sovereign airspace. But China has, for the last 15 years or so, been very interested in that altitude between, you know, 50 and 100,000 feet. They call it near space. And they believe that, hey, if you can build a platform there with sensors on it, it can linger a lot longer than, say, a low Earth orbit satellite, which due to physics has to go really, really fast. It can also be much better bigger and heavier again a, a satellite's got you know a couple hundred pounds at, at most you know because it's so expensive to get it into orbit and so they they have seen some advantages to um to to build things and they've had designs for zeppelins and all kinds of stuff over the last 15 years so it's a very active program but politically what you're talking about i think what was um disheartening about it is that you're right in that period um tony blinken the u.s secretary of state was scheduled to go to China for, you know, to kind of warm relations a little bit when they'd, and they'd been pretty darn cold. And this balloon program is run out of um, a, an area in Southeast China, very close to Taiwan, called Hainan Island. And Hainan Island is the home of the Strategic Support Force. This was Xi Jinping's, like, um, pet project, was to create this this force that that does a combination of space and cyber, and it's sort of like this this next generational frontier warfare. Well, those are the guys in charge of the the spy balloons. And what happened, I think, is that while it looks like Xi Jinping is you know always in charge and always knows what's going on and approves everything, the Chinese Communist Party actually has several um, competitive political entities within it, including the People's Liberation Army, the PLA. And Xi Jinping made a couple of moves, you know, over the last couple of years in the various Chinese Communist Party Congresses to get people out of the way, you know, to kind of like bring the PLA to heel. And something I think that is a foreign concept for for Americans to to understand is that the PLA doesn't swear an oath to a constitution, right? It, 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 it swears an oath to a party, to the Chinese Communist Party. And so there's this competition within the party as to who's in charge. And I, I, th I have read that one of the things that could have happened was that there was a bit of left hand not talking to right hand, that, that the SSF down in Highland, Hainan Island launched the spy balloon stupidly, you know, the week before um, T Tony Blinken was to visit, but also possibly purposefully to sort of show, you know, to, to cast, to, to change the, the dynamic of relations with the Americans because they, they are a little more aggressive. What the telling thing is that Xi Jinping, you know, could have, could have said, you know, we're sorry, but he didn't, <laughs> right? They, he, he sided effectively with his own military. And I think that that was because he had to, um, to, to continue to stay in power. So really unfortunate event. I guess that the theory I'm putting forward is that there are those within the PLA who have a policy objective of having more hostile relations uh, with the with the U.S. Why? Oh, it increases their power. Um, I think it's a natural uh, aggressiveness of a of a professional military to say no, no, no. You need to invest more here. We're ready to take Taiwan. We want to take Taiwan. Don't don't sell us out and make some kind of you know peace deal. I, I think it's it's like that. Interesting. So you think there's enough hawkish um, pocket vetoes going on here? I do. I do. Uh, I think it's. I just think in a in an organization that large and political that that I think there is some of that um, under the covers. Every now and then it slips out into into public. Um, I think some Chinese 
general was caught or admiral was caught boasting uh not right around the the balloon episode where he's like hey all you taiwanese just you know get ready this is your new reality we're coming i mean really bellicose language that hey if an if an american general said something he'd be fired right he'd be gone tomorrow a hundred pr people would descend on the pentagon and come up with the right messaging as to how screwed up he was etc whereas i i think that there there is a large contingent within the pla that's that's aggressive interesting it seems like that would be something xi jinping would do uh maybe let happen once and then never ever 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 let that happen ever again (laughs) could could be right i mean we i those people get disappeared pretty quick i don't know right it it could be and it could be like yeah he's like stalin right and and you know you just show up in a gulag if if you do that but um i think that there are enough pockets of various um uh strengths in the pla that it's not quite that simple and that he sort of has to continue to win some approval and support from within the CCP. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I want to talk to you about, it kind of relates a little bit to the book, I guess, um, was the weapons of mass destruction ordeal um, where we, we went in under the guise of there being weapons of mass destruction in Iraq um, that was used against the Iranians. um, And we felt like they were still there in the second Gulf war, sort of the impetus for starting the war. (laughs) Um, but it, from what I've read recently, and I'm getting more and more signals that this is what actually happened, most people inside Iraq actually did not know that they didn't have weapons of mass destruction. They just, it was one of those like, everyone wants it to be true so that they have a more positive defensive strategy and like you won't come in because you're worried. And it was one of those like deep state sort of like everyone just shut up. Like I heard from a friend of a friend that we have these things kind of deal. But like, how do we guarantee going forward that we're getting the right type of intelligence going? I mean, that was such a blunder on such a large scale. It seems like that would be something we would <laughs> really try to avoid. I, mean, I, I, I don't have the answers to that, but I would say that it's not like Iraq was a, a peace loving country that was just sitting there making harps. And we went in and, and thought, oh, gosh, we thought those were nukes. Mm-hmm. Remember, in 1981, Osirak was a was a nuclear reactor where they were enriching uranium and the israelis went and and took it out right yeah. throughout the uh 1990s um iraq was thwarting the efforts of the iaea quite aggressively right and and constantly saying oh no no we're working on it but it's but it's peaceful just like we're seeing with iran today so they they sort of i think that they wanted to create um that myth to a certain extent and you sort of look back and go gosh that that didn't work out too well for anybody, no, right? It really did not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I think to your to your to your point, how do you make sure that 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 doesn't happen? I mean, how do you make sure any intelligence is perfect? I, I think it is. It, it's always going to be um, open to mistakes. There are some observations, I guess. I would I would make is that um, one of the reasons that we have sixteen or seventeen intelligence agencies is that. There is an encouragement for um, for diversity of thought as opposed to to group think. Um, there's also specialists and specialties that come from you know all these different uh, disciplines. And so at the end of the day, you're trying to put this stuff together into a cohesive puzzle. Now back in the day, that was the CIA's job under George Tenet, and um, he that he, what happens is is that. Uh, we actually commissioned something called a national intelligence estimate or an NIE and that's central um, in this book. And in that NIE, the um, CIA's national clandestine service actually has the job of going and vetting all these sources and, and basically signing off on it. And that we went through that, all that, all that rigor and still ended up um, where we did. So I think it's always going to be a, uh, a big challenge. I don't know that it's ever going to be perfect. I think what it does is it calls in to question that, you know, can you ever really have a doctrine of preemption, you know? Um, and I think certainly you can, but your information better be damned good. And in one, one of the scenes I have in this book is are, are around that among some Israelis who want to act more aggressively when they think Hezbollah actually has you know, these, these capabilities, they want to go in pretty substantially. And there's others that are basically saying, you know, that would be us 
um, striking first, but there is this, uh, there is which, this, which the Mossad has done. Yes, they do, and yeah. and that actually comes from Talmudic law. There's a uh, there's a, a tract that is that is uh, called "Rise and Kill First. and it's basically, hey, when somebody's coming to kill you, get up and get them first. Right? This goes back to kind of core uh, core Jewish belief, and uh, and I have the characters uh, debating that philosophy in the book. I mean, the Israelis are not above flying F-16s over borders and dropping bombs. No, one time I met, I met a, uh, I, I met an Israeli, a senior Air Force officer, and, um, and, and I said, "How far will you guys go to prevent from Iran from getting a nuclear weapon?" And he said, two thousand nautical miles." <laughs> <laughs> he just needs more tankers in the yeah, way. Right. Go further. <laughs> <laughs> we can help you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to spend just a minute talking about OPEC and OPEC Plus. Um, I mean, this seems to be the origin of a lot of uh, superpower strength and strength projection by virtue of you know the petrodollar or the petro euro or the petro ruble or whatever it's going to end up being at the end of the day, uh, yuan or whatever. Um. What what do you think is happening right now? What how, what do you think the backroom conversations are having amongst these Middle Eastern countries that are looking at how the United States has acted towards Russia, and the fact that Russia, you know, is still one of the largest exporters of oil, even despite the 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 sanctions and blockades or anything we else we might put in place. Like what what do you think is happening over there? Um, I think that there's a combination of short-term thinking and long-term thinking. I think in, in the short term, it's, Hey, we have an opportunity to um, squeeze and raise prices in a way that we haven't uh, in a while. So, so let's, let's do that. Um, But I would, I would, I think it's, I think something that's really interesting is, is what's been happening in the UAE and Saudi Arabia. So, so Saudi Arabia, traditionally one of the world's largest uh, producers of oil, right? Saudi Aramco but the 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 gentleman in charge of Saudi Arabia today, Mohammed bin Salman, has built this vision to say, "Hey, Saudi Arabia 2030, it's going to look completely different." And the way he's going to do that is he's going to be build this dream city. It's called Neom, N E O M, and it is a combination sort of biosphere, uh, silicon, you know, fab place. Uh, entertainment destination las vegas kind of kind of hotel um and the uh the the marketing for it is certainly quite impressive uh the vision behind it i think is is very interesting and telling in that they're they're looking at the world and saying we we can't you know we we can't just function and be a, an oil exporter forever and in, into the future even though yes oil will continue to be important it will be less so when we can't just, you know, jack up prices and see, you know, the price of the pump go up by a dollar and then politicians, you know, react kind of instantly, right? Um, because when everyone's driving uh, electric cars or alternative energy sources, that's that's no longer that's no longer a thing, and he sees that coming. So I do think that there's this there's this opportunity in the short term in the the Russia Ukraine conflict for them to make trouble by raising prices and that's you know a function of of uh, let's just call it opportunistic but i also think that they know the smart ones know that this is not something that's going to hold up forever mm-hmm. and so would you say that green tech is uh, a saving grace or is we're starting to export our problems uh, uh, into a different realm of needing different types of materials. Um, and- I, I'd say two things. One, I'd say, yeah, there's some of that in the latter. First off, I would say that green tech is an and, it's not an or, right? Like I, I think all forms of energy are kind of good forms of energy. And, and you know, I think that we should continue to pump oil in the United States and hopefully you use less of it over time, but to not, this gets back to that diversity point, but to not be so dependent on, we went from being a net exporter to being a net importer over the last, you know, five to five to seven years. And I won't get into why I think that happened because it has to do with domestic politics, but the fact is we did. And so all of a sudden we're more vulnerable in that, in that aspect. 
I think green technology is a wonderful thing, but there's vulnerabilities there too. Green technology, all every everything that goes into um, uh, solar panels and uh, batteries involves rare earth minerals that right now they are they come from you know the ground. They're not actually that rare. The rare part is refining them. Eighty to ninety percent of that refining happens in China. The reason it happens in China is because it's such a horrific environmental mess. Mm -hmm. You're basically pouring a bunch of acid over dirt to isolate these rare earth minerals. And we've outsourced all of that to China. Back in 2010, um, you know, China and Japan are always fighting over, uh, I think it's the Senkaku Islands. Well, back in 2010, the Japanese arrested a, a Chinese uh, fishing trawler captain and said, hey, um, you know, you guys violated our so sovereignty. And China said, oh, yeah? You like your consumer electronics industry? Well, we're going to kind of withhold shipping you all these uh, rare earth uh, minerals. That was 2010. So they actually have a history of flexing their muscles with these things. So so my, my point is that, like, green technology, I think, is inherently a good thing. And I think it's part of progress and evolution and that, you know, if it can help environmentally, great. But you can't be a Pollyanna about it. You have to think through, this is a new supply chain problem. How do we get diversity there? How do we make sure that we're not just dependent on, oh, well, that we haven't created a brand new OPEC? Mm -hmm. And so what do we do about that one? Do we start spreading the toxic waste around and have more rare earth uh, mines all over the world? You know, I, th I think it's like anything. Just because it's been toxic, it's probably toxic in China because they're willing to tolerate that. And I think that um, the tolerances here in the U.S., again, this gets back to if there's no cost advantage to doing it in the U.S., you'll just outsource it, right? So when it becomes something where you can't outsource it to China, then all right, well, there's a new reality that... It costs X to uh, to refine it here in the U.S. Lots of companies will then work on making that more efficient, right? That's what always happens. The, 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 the beauty of competition will create an opportunity for someone to come up with a way to do that better. But until something changes, the, the path of least resistance is to just get it from China. So policymakers have to, have to, I think, step in on some of these things and recognize when when there are strategic vulnerabilities that become national security issues. Mm -hmm. So I have this weird feeling when I talk to you and, and uh, I know, you know, but Don Bentley, mm -hmm. um, that these stories that you are writing are a window into things that you wish you could talk about. Uh, but you just can't for a variety of reasons. Am I, am I way off base there? You mean like, I, I, I think, I think you're a little bit, I, well, I wouldn't say I sit around and go like, you know, I, I wish I could talk about classified stuff, but I can't. What, what I, what the way that I think about it is, is that most people, most people go to their, go to their jobs. They, they, they work on their stuff. They're, they're busy. You know, my, my life is researching books like these. And so I spend a lot of time reading about these, these subjects and seeing areas where I feel like first off, that would be a pretty good story because it seems to me that that's something that's possible. But second off, I think it's something that people should know about. And so I like, to the extent that I have a platform at all, I want to be able to use that platform to contribute something to the debate. I just happen to do that in a, in a, in the fictional form. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Would you say then that you want to write this because any individual thing that's in your head may not make a good story in them themselves, but if you string it together in a book and you make this more of a, a coherent plot between these different interesting plot points, that will convey a message that you want to... For sure. I Look, you know, um, people inherently learn by hearing storytellers, right? There's an oral tradition, et cetera. And um, you can probably think of your own education when, you know, something was illustrated through a story and therefore you, you never forgot it. That's effectively what a fable is. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I would say that first, my, my first job is to entertain, <laughs> but if I can entertain and also highlight something that I'm important that people, that I want people to kind of like, Hey, you may not have known about this, I'm worried about it because I've been reading about it. I'm presenting you the facts. There's lots of facts, even though this is fiction and I'm dramatizing it to make it, to make it entertaining, but also to illustrate the point. 
how accurate is your book? Would you say like, cause a, a lot of, a lot of times you'll like watch a movie and you're like, that just would never in a million years actually be possible. That team doesn't exist. That company doesn't exist. That kind of thing. Um, how, how realistic do you try to make your stuff? Um, I, I strive very hard for authenticity. Uh, I do. I think it's my, um, it's my niche. Uh, there are other, look, uh, one of the challenges when you're, when you're writing fiction, uh, when you're writing a, 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 lo- a novel is you go, okay, how do I get character A to, to get, you know, to, across the world to, to be in this scene? And I, how, how's that? I know I'll just put them in an SR 71 and they just happen to strap <laughs> in, you know, or, you know, like how would he find out that for, I know I'll just give him an amazing hacker that can just figure that out. Right. And so I try to remove all that magical thinking and try to make it much more around, wow, this is a, this is a gritty problem. The characters find clever ways to get around them, but I, I try not to rely on, oh, well, didn't you know they're in this secret organization and they have every expert there is that can just tell them the answer. It's, mm-hmm. it's you know, that's no fun. I, I think um, to suspend disbelief in a book like this, I think you have to have really strong, realistic characters and good characterizations and have them have the tools that are in the real world so that they also have limits. Yeah, of course. Ideally, really, really hard limits too. That makes it more thrilling. I uh, completely it's because uh, it, a character arc is all about, Hey, they're trying to do something and they're met. They meet challenges along the way and there are challenges of such an intensity that by the time it's all said and done, it has changed that character's nature. Mm-hmm. So what would you say would be the major difference between the U S militaries or um, intelligence agencies and Mossad? Like, is there like one kind of key thing that you'd say they're different? Because it sounds like a big plot point is the is the contention I, between those two groups. I did I, I did a lot of research on Mossad for this book and actually uh, met a few former Mossad officers. And um, one of the, th- there are several things I think that, that make Mossad interesting. One is they, Israel is a country of immigrants about 75 years old. Uh, and they have the advantage of having a really diverse population of, you know, generally Jewish people who have fled other places to be in this um, in this Jewish homeland. So they've got people, you know, they've got people that speak all different languages, that have all different skin colors, et cetera. That that's really good for an intelligence agency because they can turn around and and, and make those into um, in, into embedded uh, embedded people. Um, the other thing that I thought that I wanted to present in the book is that um, is to show the challenges that Mossad itself has in the way that it's organized. So there's a, an operational wing called um, Caesarea that uh, then works with the military intelligence wing, which is called Amman and, and their, their version of the NSA, which is called unit 8200. And I wanted to illustrate um, the way that those three organizations would operate with each other. And then they also have a fourth one, which are um, special forces uh, that they call bayonets as well as their Navy SEAL team, which is called flotilla 13. And I wanted to show that, yeah, they, they're, they have, they have these highly specialized professional organizations that, that all come together. That always leads to challenges too, right? Just like it does for, for the U S anytime you've got multiple organizations going on, you've got, joint operations and frustrations and differences of opinions and communications challenges. And I wanted to show that Mossad isn't magic. They've got amazing capabilities spread across these divisions, but they've also got the classic challenges of just people working together. And that, that was, that's a big theme in the book. And you also have, I mean, having a lot of different backgrounds is interesting. Um, I know you uh, wrote a lot of women into your uh, characters as well. Um, is that uh, is that integral to your plot? Uh, uh, it is integral to the plot on, on on a couple levels, with respect to um, what I was just mentioning around showing showing how Mossad works. They are unique in that they use women extensively in their in As their assets. operations because they think that they blend in better. And so I wanted to I wanted to illustrate that. So one of the key uh, key people is a Lebanese woman who works for um, for Mossad. On the American side, um, the the protagonists are, are really a divorced couple where it's a, a woman who is relatively senior in the National Clandestine Service. I wanted her um, partially to 
have a strong female character, be sort of a foil for the stupid stuff men do, um, and show the challenges of having a, a life where you're a single mom, et cetera. But also to have the higher level debates within the American infrastructure to say, you know, is this the right thing? Do we have the right strategy, uh, et cetera. Her ex-husband is um, a former CIA officer who gets pulled into this, who doesn't want to. But um, that's my opportunity to bring someone, you know, to bring a perspective on the ground and uh, into, into something where he thinks, oh, this is political or, you know, I don't, I think this is their, the way they're doing this is dumb to effectively simplifying the problem because he's on the ground. Whereas his ex-wife is looking at it at a, a higher level and is trying to do something more strategic. Interesting. Well, Don, this is great. Um, where do people buy your book? When's it come out? When I, I will talk to Don. I will tell him oh, you think it's great. <laughs> I'm going to see him in an hour. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's, yeah, right. that, that's why I was thinking of yeah. this. I, you told yeah, yeah, me yeah. you were going to see him. Um, yeah. Sorry, MP. Uh, when <laughs> when do people, uh, when do people, your book come out? And uh, uh, The book went on sale uh, two days ago, May 23rd. And uh, I'm on I'm on tour right now. I'm here in Austin and, and I'm going to be with Don Bentley with uh, his two new books, uh, Flashpoint, which is a Tom Clancy Jr. novel and Forgotten War, which is from his Matt Drake series. I was going to say, I really like the cover art. And you have another book. Um, it's, the Handler yeah, was, was the predecessor to this it's one. It's a very similar cover. I really they try They, they uh, yeah, when when you're, so the, I'm with Penguin Random House and uh, under the Berkeley imprint. And covers is always an interesting topic because effectively mm. the way it works, they go, here's a cover, isn't it great? Right? You don't really have a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of input into it, but... Um, you have people who know what they're doing. So uh -huh. that's the good part. Well, that's good. Um, and so where can they get it? Is a anywhere books are sold. So, you know, we're, we're at Barnes and Noble tonight, but obviously uh, Amazon, all, all book retailers. Also, of course, ebook, Kindle, audiobook on Audible, et cetera. Yeah, great. And any next things you're doing that you want to talk about that are coming up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've 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 completed uh, a third book in the series, which um, should be out next year. And I, I have a standalone, which hues much more closely. No, no, you know, no, no giveaways to what we were talking earlier about the Navy and oh, okay. and China. Um, and I'm uh, I'm about uh, two thirds of the way through through that one. It's a standalone book. It's not part of this uh, part of this series. Wow, so. you're a writing machine. Yeah, man. I'm just I got a lot of arthritis in my knuckles. So let's, <laughs> let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if you got it in you, you got to get it out. I, and that's and that's a little how I feel. I like to get it out. Yeah, yeah great. Yeah. Well, Pete, this has been awesome. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming down and uh, safe travels back to yeah. Seattle. Yeah, <laughs> my, my pleasure, Robert. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.